Well, I've already um, <clears throat> read the text this morning in order to save just a bit of time, but let me just read one verse as, as we begin to refocus us on what we've been looking at, and that would be Luke chapter 15 in verse 7. And this is talking about after that lost sheep is found, uh, he says, I tell you that in the same way, that is in the same way these rejoice over the finding of this lost sheep, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Well, may the Lord bless uh, His word to our encouragement this morning uh, to motivate us to um, seek to give joy to heaven. Well, just by way of review, we, we've seen, uh, at least last week, that as believers, our experience uh, of the Christian life, uh, the way we live, should be different, should be more than uh, what it was for the Jews who were in the wilderness. Remember, God had redeemed them out of Egypt. They were a redeemed people, and they were constituted the people of God. Uh, they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. You might say it was a type of a water baptism. As a matter of fact, Jonathan Edwards uses that passage to, to prove sprinkling as the mode that we should be using because that's what was happening to them uh, when they were baptized in the wilderness. God gave them spiritual food to eat, uh, the manna from heaven. He gave them spiritual water to drink, the water from the rock, which we saw was Christ. And yet, with all these privileges, they were destroyed in the wilderness, destroyed by God's judgment because they didn't believe Him. They didn't have faith. They weren't able to enter into the promised land. In the same way, we were reminded that we can also confess the Lord Jesus as our Lord. We can become members of His church. We can be baptized into His name. We can worship Him and the Father and the Holy Spirit uh, from week to week and celebrate His supper as we do. We can do all these things and have all these privileges and still end up among the goats on the day of judgment. We need to have something more. That was the point. We need to have the same kind of spirit-empowered, spirit-created devotion in ourselves that we see in the Lord Jesus. Remember, Jesus is being formed in us by the Holy Spirit. That we see in the Apostle Paul. That we see in those in church history that we so admire, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, and still many others. Uh, we need to have that kind of devotion. In other words, we broke that down a little bit. We need to love the Lord. We read, uh, as Moses told us in Deuteronomy 6.5, as he is giving directions to the second generation uh, that are now going into the promised land. Remember, the, we just uh, were reminded about the parents who had all these privileges and they didn't enter the promised land. They were destroyed in the wilderness. This is the second generation. And the Lord is having Moses give them instruction, give them the law the second time that they might get things right. This is what the Lord wants you to do. He says in Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. You see, if we don't do this, we're not going to be able to do anything else the Lord calls us to do. We're not going to be able to live as He calls us to live in His Word, different from the world, different from the majority of those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ today, different from even what we might think is best, because we do need to remember that we can and do deceive ourselves. We have to remember that what Jeremiah, what the Lord said through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 17, 9 is still true of us even after regeneration, even after the new birth. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? All that corruption that's still in our souls can lead us astray. Uh, we need to make sure we don't trust anything else but what the Lord tells us is best for us and that He tells us in His Word. Now, if we don't love Him, we're never going to be able to serve Him in, ultimately in the way He calls us to, which is in a way that pleases Him, in a way that is aimed at His glory and His glory alone, which is why Moses goes on to say in verse 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Remember, the blessing of the new covenant is the commandments of God have been written upon our hearts so that we now desire to do what the Lord calls us to do. 
Now, we are also reminded that we won't use the freedoms, even the freedoms that the Lord gives to us. You know, not everything is, is black and white. There are certain things that, that there is liberty, liberties to what we are to eat and perhaps what we can drink. We are to use even the liberties that He gives to us to glorify Him, to serve Him, and to honor Him as He reminded us, being careful not to give any unbeliever a reason to reject us because they see us doing something they think is inconsistent with Christianity. We need to make sure we don't do that and also that we don't do something we know in front of a weaker brother or sister that they think is wrong and by our doing it will encourage them to do it while they still believe it's wrong. That's what we call stumbling the weaker brother. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So that's what we saw last week. Now, this morning, I want us to go just a bit further and consider that among all the ways that we can please the Lord, all the ways that we can glorify Him, that, that there's perhaps one that does more than just about anything else, and that is seeking and finding the lost. Again, something that we all need to be encouraged in because this is probably something the church does the least now, in each of these parables, I want us to notice a few things. We find, first of all, that there is something that is lost, right? Man has a hundred sheep, and he loses one. A woman has ten silver coins. She loses one. A man has two sons, and he loses one. Now, these things that are lost all represent those who are without Jesus, those who are without hope. In this context... Remember, Jesus is, is giving these uh, uh, in a certain context among the Jews. He's talking about those among the Jews who needed to be found through the gospel, such as the tax collectors and the sinners with whom Jesus was then speaking. These parables are actually meant to be a rebuke to the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, secondly, we see that there is something that wasn't lost. There's the 99 sheep that didn't go astray, the nine coins that were still in possession of the woman, uh, the one son that didn't leave. Now, these may represent a couple of different things, but it certainly represent the scribes and the Pharisees who were criticizing Jesus, particularly the one elder son who remained. They were criticizing Jesus because he was looking for those that were lost, right? He was reaching out to the tax collectors. And remember, the tax collectors were Rome's version of the IRS, right? They were the IRS agents the Jews that worked for Rome, and they were hated by the Jews. They were hated by the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus was also speaking to the sinners. These are the ones that were Jewish who didn't keep the law, who had no respect for the law. Jesus was ministering to them. Now, they are represented as belonging to the shepherd, belonging to the woman, belonging to the, the man. There's a relationship that is established here. Even though they had not received Jesus as their Messiah, there was still a sense in which these belonged to him, that is, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, the ones that weren't lost, the ones that were the righteous, that didn't need repentance, so to speak. So these all, again, belonged uh, to God. They were his people, his covenant people. They were the physical children of Abraham. So they're, certainly Jesus is applying these parables to them. But I think when he says righteous, you know, uh, there are those righteous who don't need repentance. I think there may also be a sense in which these represent also those who actually do belong to Him. The members of the church, those who have been found, those who haven't gone astray, especially perhaps in the, in the case of the sheep and the coins, they're not the main concern. The main concern are those who are yet to be brought in, those who are lost. Now, thirdly, we see the value of what is lost that it moves someone to search for it until it's found. The shepherd leaves the 99 who are the 99 righteous who need no repentance, and he searches for the lost sheep. The woman carefully sweeps the house for the lost coin. Now, I think we need to assume that when the prodigal son left, the father prayed, and he was certainly watching for the return of his son, hoping he hadn't died somewhere, and rejoices when he sees him. So, the one who values what is lost goes and searches for it. Now, who is that one who is searching? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the good shepherd. 
He is the one who says specifically in Matthew 15, 24, that he is the good shepherd who came out to seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And why was he seeking them? Because they were precious to him. Now, in the second place, it is the disciples who are doing the seeking uh, because Jesus gave them this responsibility, remember, just before he ascended into heaven, uh, not only to search for the lost sheep of the house of Israel to complete that, that work that Jesus began, but also those who are not of that fold, the lost sheep among the Gentiles. Remember, Jesus said on one occasion, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. They also will hear my voice and they will follow me and we, there will be one flock with one shepherd. So Jesus was intending to bring the Gentiles in as well, but he was going to do it through the disciples. And currently, the one who is seeking the lost is the church. It's us. Remember, this is the great commission that Jesus has given to us to search for the lost sheep among the Jews, although we don't do that so much, and the Gentiles, because there's many more Gentiles among us, until all of the lost sheep have been brought into his fold. And then uh, finally, there is joy in heaven when what is lost has been found. When the lost sheep and the lost coin are recovered, the owners, remember, call their, uh, his or you know, her friends together and neighbors and they rejoice together because what was lost was found. When the prodigal son returned, the father called his servants to kill the fattened calf and they celebrated together. And this represents how heaven rejoices each time a lost soul is brought home through the gospel by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think the, the main thrust of these parables is this, this joy. You know, this is the joy that Jesus was after. This is the joy the scribes and the Pharisees as the shepherds of Israel should be after. And this is the joy that we should be seeking. And that is that heaven might rejoice through the finding of that which is lost. Now, is there anybody that's lost in the world today? Well, obviously. We know that most of the people who are in this world are lost. I mean, if you don't believe that, just turn on the news if you haven't turned it on recently and watch it for a few minutes, and you'll see the string of bad news. There's a lot of bad news because there's a lot of evil, because there's a lot of unconverted people who are lost. But I want us to realize it's also true that there are some of those yet to be found, yet to be gathered into God's kingdom, some, but not all, through the gospel. Now, all are to be preached to, but not all are going to come to the kingdom of heaven because, remember, the Bible does not teach universal salvation. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, they don't represent all the unbelieving Jews. They don't rep represent all the unbelieving Gentiles who are in the world. They represent those who belong to Jesus. I don't know if you noticed this, but the shepherd was going after one of his sheep, right? The woman was going after a coin that belonged to her. Uh, the prodigal, uh, excuse me, the father was, was watching for the son who was his son, he was in relationship with. Uh, these are those that belong to Jesus, that are in the world, that have yet to be gathered. These are the ones the father has promised to give his son as a reward for his work. Now, I know that, you know, that's exactly what Jesus tells us in John chapter 6, verse 37. Listen to what he says. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. All that the Father gives me? Well, who are those people? Those are the sheep for whom Jesus has laid down his life. Remember at the end of John chapter 6 when Jesus says something very difficult, even for his disciples to understand, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, and how it offended the many Jews who were there. This is a hard saying. How can we, how can we receive that? And Jesus said, didn't I tell you that unless it's been given you by the Father, you can't come to me? Uh, he was telling them that you're not the sheep that I'm looking for. You're not the lost sheep. And they left. They didn't follow Jesus anymore. And then he turns to the 12 and he says, are you going to leave also? And Peter says, Lord, where else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. He says, did I not myself choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? You see, there's this difference between uh, everyone who is lost and these lost sheep. These are the lost sheep who will hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ and hearing will believe. Now, these have not all been found yet, have they? Because if they had, 
then Jesus would already come. Because that's the only thing that, that is really keeping him from coming. Uh, if they were all found, there wouldn't be any reason for him to wait. It wouldn't be generation after generation of no one preaching the gospel and people being born and so forth that aren't going to be saved. Once the fullness of the Jews and the Gentiles have been gathered in, then Jesus is going to return. Paul makes that argument in Romans chapter 11, verse 15. Let me just break this down for a moment. Let me just first of all read it. For if their rejection is, is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And what Paul is saying here is if their, that is the ethnic Jews, the physical seat of Abraham, if their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember he came into Jerusalem and he on riding on the donkey and he was presenting himself as the king of Israel and they rejected him. If, if their rejection of him, their crucifying of him is the reconciliation of the world. Now, Paul in that whole context tells us a partial hardening has happened to the Jews so that, they, they might, so that God might send the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, that's the reconciliation of the world. The word, uh, the word of reconciliation has been sent out to the world. So if the Jews' rejection brought the gospel to the Gentiles, what will their acceptance, that is the, the sheep that the Lord has yet to gather out of the Jews, their acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ be but life from the dead? Now, life from the dead there can mean one of two things. It can either mean if they accept Jesus, they will be raised spiritually, or it can mean... The resurrection is going to take place when Israel finally receives her Messiah. Paul says essentially the same thing in verse 12 of Romans chapter 11. He says, now if their transgression, the Jews, is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Now, in verses 25 and 26, Paul says this, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. And I think what Paul is arguing here is that through this process of the partial hardening of the Jews and turning to the Gentiles and turning to the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to receive their Messiah, that as he goes through this process of gathering his sheep out of Jews and Gentiles, once they have all been saved, then all, once all Israel has been saved, the Israel of God, the true Israel, which is made up of all believing Jews and Gentiles, the true spiritual seed of Abraham, then the partial hardening will end because the, you're basically going to have fulfillment. We're going to have resurrection. We're going to have the end once they're all gathered in. Jesus is going to come again. Jesus is going to return when all the Jews and Gentiles that the Father has given to him have been found. Now, the point is, this hasn't happened yet. And since it hasn't, there are still some yet to be gathered, which means there are some who will listen to the gospel, who will believe when you tell them about Jesus and who will be saved. Now, this should be our encouragement. Do you realize that this was the encouragement and the confidence that Jesus had? All that the Father gives to me shall come to me. He had no question. He had no doubt about that. He didn't go out wondering, is anyone going to be saved? As he sees Israel turning against him, is anyone going to believe or all going to reject? That wasn't his stance. His stance was this, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. How can I cast out anyone who comes to me? Because the Father has given them to me, and he'll receive them warmly. So Jesus knows all these sheep are going to come to him. They are all going to be gathered. He had that confidence. You know that Paul had that same confidence. He basically was willing to endure all things for the sake of those who were the Lord's sheep, who were his chosen so that they might obtain eternal life. Uh, it wasn't that he wasn't concerned about anyone else. You, you don't know who the sheep are and who those aren't the sheep. We're supposed to tell everyone, but it's just the sheep who are going to respond. And Paul knew that was going to happen. And Jesus knew that was going to happen. As a matter of fact, George Whitfield knew that was going to happen. Jonathan Edwards knew that would happen. Spurgeon knew that would happen. And he expected it to happen every single Lord's Day that the Lord's sheep would hear his voice and they would come to him. The idea that God is going to gather his people together like this has actually been uh, spoken of as something that should kill evangelism. But it's really something that encourages it because it gives us the confidence that what we're doing is actually going to make a difference.
So essentially, we need to be seeking that which is lost. Now, to find them, we need to make sure that we guard ourselves, secondly, from a self-righteous and uncaring spirit. Remember the elder brother and his attitude when the younger brother came in, how he was offended and how the scribes and the Pharisees were offended when Jesus was reaching out to sinners? We need to make sure we keep ourselves from the attitude that we're better than others. We need to remember where the Lord found us, right? I mean, we were, uh, the Bible says that Abraham, the father of the faithful, the one who was the friend of God, that he was dug out of a pit. Well, if he was dug out of a pit, where does that leave us, you know? I mean, the Lord also lifted us up out of the pit and put our feet on the solid rock. We need to learn to have mercy on others even as the Lord has had mercy on us. We, we've got to, you know, guard ourselves against this, a self-righteous attitude. Pulling in our skirts and we see people that we, you know, don't want to have to deal with and realize God had mercy on us. We need to have mercy on others. And we need to look for them. We need to search for them. Like the shepherd who left his sheep and went to look for the one that was lost. Or like the woman who swept the house carefully looking for the lost coin. We need to go and look. Which means we need to go where there are actually unbelievers present. Places where we work. Neighborhoods in which we live. You know, get to know the neighbors a bit. How do we do that? It's kind of hard these days because everybody just sort of just sequesters themselves in their house and they don't seem to come out. But there's a time when some people are out, sometimes, maybe if you have a dog, take your dog for a walk. And as you're walking around the neighborhood, walk during the time your neighbors are out and say hello, get to know them, build a relationship. Go to social events when your families get together, uh, sporting events, games, uh, picnics. Try to connect with other people. And when you're there, you don't necessarily have to come up to somebody and accost them with the gospel. That, that's not terribly effective these days, is it? But instead, shine the light of Christ. Be different, right? Serve like Jesus served. Don't expect people to serve you. You serve others. Speak like Jesus would speak. Don't join in to the, you know, with the various things that people are saying. If the content isn't something we should be talking about, instead try to introduce good things. So speak like Jesus, love like Jesus, and as he gives you the opportunity, share the gospel. You know, if you were to ask everybody how they came to faith in Jesus, I think we'd all say it was different. At some point, we all heard the gospel. We had to hear the gospel. But it wasn't necessarily at the hearing of that gospel that we were saved. Maybe it was something else that happened in our lives. Sometimes, you know, people are saved by hearing. Other times, an act of love, an act of sacrifice, of service, uh, sometimes an act of mercy, sometimes just forgiving somebody who's done something against you, just seeing how you live. Remember how uh, David Livingston was living and how, I forget now, was it um, Stanley who went to look for him? And how he observed Livingston over the several weeks after he found him. And he said, this man must be an angel. He was so self-sacrificing. His heart was so much for these people. He was serving the people of, of Africa. Uh, he wasn't even that much of an evangelist, uh, Livingston. I mean, I think there was only one person who was actually converted to Christ through him. He mapped all of Africa. But his lifestyle and, and the love that he showed to those people... Uh, was really what the Lord would have us to do, and, and it's what convicted Stanley and uh, brought him to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you know what? The Lord uses all different kinds of things. We just need to be sowing those different kinds of things wherever we go uh, as much as we can. Don't you know, put your light under a, a bushel, but let it shine brightly so that the world can see. And then finally, we need to remember as a, an additional motivation what our success is means to heaven. Again, I'll remind you of our text in Luke 15, verse 7. Jesus says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, what that means is that when one of Jesus' lost sheep is found, there's joy in heaven. Now, the second time he says it, there's joy in the presence of the angels. But there's joy in other places in heaven too, right? The Father rejoices, the Son rejoices, the Holy Spirit rejoices, the, the saints who are already in heaven, they rejoice, as well as the angels. There's celebration in heaven every time a lost sinner 
is brought to repentance, and that is saving repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time they trust in the Lord, they rejoice more over that than 99 who don't need repentance. That's, again, the difference. There is more rejoicing. Now, if our chief purpose in life, as we've already seen, is to glorify God, and in glorifying Him, enjoy Him, remember our pleasure needs to come from giving God glory, then we need to give ourselves to seeking the lost sheep. Because, as we've just seen, this is the one thing that pleases Him more than anything else. Now, God is pleased by our worship. He's pleased by our fellowship. He's pleased by our service to one another. He's pleased by, you know, uh, the things that He calls us to do. Those things do please Him. But this pleases Him more than these other things. And yet, this is probably the thing we leave most undone because it's most uncomfortable. So, this evening, we're going to focus a little bit on how we can gain the resources we need to be able to glorify God in this particular way. Because you know what? In the Lord Jesus Christ, all things are possible. We can overcome any impediment that gets in our way through Him. So we'll look at that this evening. But for now, let's remember that what gives the Lord glory is that when uh, one of those for whom Jesus laid down His life is brought savingly to Him, they rejoice. So let's seek to be a source of rejoicing for heaven by sowing that seed and seeing the lost come to him. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us do this.